This conference will now be so, recorded. So with that being said, we will um, we will go ahead and get started. Okay. So today is week 10. Can you believe it? We've made it all the way to week 10. This is crazy. It's just, we've made it so far. It feels like it's taken forever to just get to this week, but it's been it's been a very busy past couple of weeks. Um, so today we're going to just quickly do a couple questions. Um, most of it is going to be questions. We're going to we are going to touch a bit on respiratory services. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more involved than the other areas, but just be prepared. Lots of questions. Um, we're going to have lots of opportunities to answer. OK, so we're going to start with Chapter 63, which is ophthalmology services. And so we're going to go ahead and get started with question one. A patient who underwent intraocular surgery was diagnosed with a non-infectious endothelmitis after the procedure. The infection preventionist initiates an investigation to identify the possible cause. Which of the following factors should be considered? One, improper handling, cleaning, and rinsing of the instruments. Two, improper labeling of the solutions. Three, gloves and powder. Or four, prophylactic antibiotics administered two hours after the procedure. So you can go ahead and put your answer in the box, in the little chat box. Okay, very good. So the majority of us are putting A as the answer, which is correct. So improper handling, cleaning, and rinsing of the instruments, as well as gloves and powder. So when you are, um, this is actually like a pretty, uh, this is like a pretty good question um, to ask because you have a perfect example of one way that you can easily get rid of two answer choices. So. When they're saying in number four, prophylactic antibiotics administered two hours after the procedure, is that really prophylactic administration of antibiotics? Can you can you consider that prophylaxis if it's administered two hours after the procedure? Right, the answer is no, and why is that? What do we consider a prophylactic antibiotic? When is it given? Before a procedure, excellent. So we can immediately get rid of number four. That automatically knocks out answer C or D. Remember when you're taking this test, it's all about using the knowledge that you already have and applying it to all the tricks that they're gonna, that they're gonna try to catch you in. When you're taking when you're taking the test, so that already would have lit, would have um, let you know. Okay, one is definitely one of them. Now I just have to choose in between improper labeling of the solutions and gloves and powder. Okay. All right. So good job, and then we'll read the rationale. Endothelmitis is an inflammatory condition of the intraocular cavities. Aqueous and or vitreous humor usually caused by infection. Non-infectious endothelmitis may result from various causes such as retained native lens material after an operation or from toxic agents. Improper cleaning and rinsing of surgical instruments can leave a residue which can irritate the eye and cause inflammation. Gloves, especially those with powder, can also cause inflammation of the eye during surgery. All right, next question. I know, okay, so Enid, that's a, that's a really good, so you're saying it's confusing because powder gloves have not been in use in the OR for years. I completely, so I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, that, okay, that's why you have to make sure that you pay attention to your APIC text, right? Remember, I'm telling you, your test is gonna come primarily from two places, your APIC text and your CDC guidelines. You're obviously going to have some other things sprinkled in. You may have some AORN stuff, some Amy stuff, um, some Shea stuff sprinkled in, but that's where the primary bulk of your work is coming from. <clears throat> okay, question two. Non-infectious post-operative endothelmitis is most often associated with A, wearing contact lens, lenses, I guess, <laughs> B, toxic anterior segment syndrome, C, conjunctivitis, 
or D, keratitis? All right, very good. For everyone who put B, toxic anterior segment syndrome, you are correct. So um, this is when you have a non-infectious material in the anterior segment of the eye. It can happen about 12 to 48 hours after surgery. It's limited to the anterior segment, and you're going to have those gram stains, um, which are negative. So here's our rationale. Healthcare-associated endophthalmitis can be, ni can be either non-infectious or infectious. Non-infectious endophthalmitis is an adverse event with several presenting causes, including retained lens material and other introduced toxic substances. Frequency is unknown, but occurrence is not rare. Non-infectious postoperative endophthalmitis is most often associated with TAS, T-A-S-S, an acute rapid onset of sterile anterior segment inflammation that mimics infectious endophthalmitis. Outbreaks of TAS have been associated with breaches in handling, cleaning, and disinfecting surgical instruments, introduction of contaminated solutions, contaminated intraocular lenses, and toxic medications during surgery, powder from gloves, and irritants like dried blood, endotoxins, and residual detergent left on instruments. Okay, this next one is a really great question. It's a really great example of, of the, the questions that um, Civic likes, likes to put on their tests. So epidemic keratoconjunctivitis is a viral conjunctivitis caused by a group of adenoviruses. EKC is highly contagious and can be problematic in ambulatory surgery settings. Recommended measures for control of these infections include, one, disinfection of tonometer tip in 3% hydrogen peroxide, two, sterilize ophthalmoscopes between uses, three, disinfection of the environment, and four, frequent hand hygiene. Okay, we have quite a bit of different answer choices that have been selected. We've got lots of Bs and lots of Cs. So most people are stuck between B and C. So when you're looking at this question, you always have to ask yourself, what are these people trying to make sure I know, right? What is it that they're trying to make sure that I understand? The honest to goodness truth is that you really don't have to know <laughs> anything really about epidemic keratoconjunctivitis um, to answer this question. It's it's great if you do, but that's not what the question is trying to figure out. It's it's really trying to figure out um, recommended measures for control of infections when it comes to you know eye equipment and eye procedures. So one of the very first things that should kind of you know, raise a flag for you is when you see this this option here, sterilize ophthalmoscopes between uses. Okay, so who can tell me what my three classifications for the Spalding criteria are? There are three classifications for the Spalding criteria that you need to be extremely familiar with for your um, for your test. Okay, Enid is Enid is on fire today. Okay, she's got she's got a lot to say. So she said critical, semi-critical. <laughs> um, very good. Okay, yeah. So. We've got our, uh, our, we're going to have our critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. So when you see an ophthalmoscope that needs to be sterilized, what do we, what category of the Spalding criteria do we use sterilization for? Our critical devices, semi-critical, or non-critical? Our critical devices, very good, Wanda. So. Is an ophthalmoscope a critical device? Okay, very good. Enid said no, it is not correct. So the second that we really get rid of this answer choice and we realize this doesn't really make any sense, we're left with everything that we really need to know for this question. Okay. 
So here we have our different types of classifications, which is your um, device classification of your critical, semi-critical, and non-critical. Um, let me go ahead and erase all of my drawings. And let's look at IFUs for an ophthalmoscope. You can see it right here, Spalding classification for the US. It's a non-critical device, which means we just have to, you know, adhere specifically for this one. Um, it's just telling you, you can use a super sandy cloth, um, you do what you need to do, but it is it is a um, it's a non-critical device. So prevention of EKC requires meticulous attention to hand washing, soap and water, and or alcohol-based hand sanitizers should be used before and after each patient contact. Gloves should be worn and discarded appropriately during outbreaks and when exposure to patients' tears or excretions is likely. The current CDC recommendations for disinfection of tonometer tips include a five to 10 minute soak in 3% hydrogen peroxide. Um, 70% isopropyl alcohol, 70% ethyl alcohol, or in 5,000 parts per million of bleach. Ophthalmoscopes should be wiped with 70% alcohol between patients. All right, so chapter 67, respiratory care services. Let's go through, let's go through some updates. Okay, so who here is aware that um, SHEA, IDSA, and APIC just last month released their updates for strategies to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia? Has anyone had the opportunity to read this document yet? Or is this your first time hearing about it? Because <laughs> let me tell you, it was my first time hearing about it this week, okay? So as soon as the as soon as the CLABSI um, compendium came out from Shea, I was all over it. Now I am biased. Okay, I'm gonna be perfectly honest. I'm gonna I'm gonna come clean. I do have a favorite HAI. Okay, I have a favorite healthcare associated infection. And my favorite HAI is CLABSIS. Okay, I just, I am very passionate about vascular access. I have grown very close to my vascular access team here. Um, our, in fact, our, our ICU has been working so hard um, on their, you know, on their CLABSI prevention strategies. And so that is, that is my favorite. Um, it's the one that I've enjoyed learning about the most. And so, I mean, I, I really shouldn't have a favorite, but it is. And so I was very excited to read over the CLABSI um update but this just completely went under the radar for me i i attended a lecture by linda green this week through the florida hospital association and that's where i found out that these had also been updated because i know they're working on updating all of their um shea idsa apic practice recommendations to all of their compendium like their compendium they're working on updating it Okay, guys, so like buckle up because when I tell you I was not prepared for this, I was really not prepared for this. And this may be old news for some of you, but it was very, very brand new news for me this week. So in this update, which was done last month on May 20th of 2022, they had this not recommended category. And the very first bullet point took me out. So not recommended is oral care with chlorhexidine. How many of you guys are doing daily oral care with chlorhexidine in your intensive care units right now? Do you know if you're doing it? Okay, not getting a lot of responses. Well, yeah, so, so buckle up, Buttercup, because it is definitely not recommended per this compendium, um, which is jointly published through Shea, IDSA, and APIC. Okay, I was not prepared. So, not recommended oral care with chlorhexidine, probiotics ultra thin polyurethane endotracheal tube cuffs, tapered endotracheal tube cuffs, automated control of endotracheal cuff pressures and frequent endotracheal cuff pressure monitoring. They do have a new section on the prevention of non-ventilator hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, so yeah, it, exactly, I'm getting some response. Okay, finally, some people, I, I, let me tell you, I was not prepared yes, you know, yesterday or the day before. And I was like, am I sure I'm reading this right? So it's it's not only not recommended, it's a potential risk factor for a ventilator-associated event, 
Okay, potential risk factors for ventilator-associated events include sedatives, especially benzodiazepines and propofol, opioids, positive fluid balance, mandatory modes of mechanical ventilation with high tidal volumes and or high inspiratory-driven pressures, blood transfusions, oral care with chlorhexidine, stress ulcer prophylaxis, patient transport, gastric retention, reintubation, and neuromuscular blockade. Okay? And you know, I, I just kept reading. I was like, listen, am I really reading this correctly? Um, but yes, yes, under essential practices, if you look right here where the little arrow is, it says provide oral care with toothbrushing, but without chlorhexidine. So um, this has really nothing to do with the APIC text, but I wanted to make sure that I shared this with everyone because I know we've all been busy. Uh, you know, we're, everyone's paying attention to different HAIs in their hospital. VAEs may not be a problem at your facility, um, but it's a good time to start looking at your bundles and, um, you know, what policies reviews may be coming up for you in just a couple months, depending on when you review them, whether it's the end of the year, like Q4 or Q1 of 2023. And I think it's important to be up to date with um, some of those some of those guidelines. This is an open access document, so you know you don't have to pay for it. It's open access. It's through Shea. It's the strategies to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, and it was published last month. Okay, moving on. Um, I will send out these links, and this is just a respiratory system crash course that I recommend you guys watch. It's excellent. So our respiratory system, where where we've got those major functions of res of the respiratory system, which is to supply the body with O2 for cellular respiration and dispose of CO2, a waste product of cellular respiration. The respiratory and circulatory system are very closely coupled, and it, it, the respiratory system also functions in olfaction and speech. So here's our respiratory system. Respiration involves four processes. You've got your pulmonary ventilation, which, have mo which is movement of air into and out of the lungs. You've got external respiration, which is exchange of O2 and CO2 between lungs and the blood. And then your circulatory system is, you know, is helping you with that transport of the O2 and the CO2 in the blood. And that internal respiration is the exchange of O2 and CO2 between systemic blood vessels and tissues. So what's the functional anatomy of our respiratory system? We've got our upper respiratory um, system, which is the nose and nasal cavities, paranasal uh, sinuses, and the pharynx, and then our lower respiratory system, which is going to be our larynx, the trachea, bronchi, and branches, the lungs, and alveoli. All right, this is a another great picture really kind of showing you um, the major respiratory organs in relation to all of those surrounding structures so you can see that nasal cavity that oral cavity um, and I think it's just very important to get familiar with a lot of the terminology that your that your respiratory therapists use to communicate um, and that will help you understand some of some of the issues surrounding infection prevention and respiratory care so, respiratory care services. The respiratory care services provides diagnostic and therapeutic procedures to monitor and support respiratory function. Your RTs are doing everything and anything in the hospital. I mean, they are so involved in the patient's care. They are such a great resource of information, knowledge, um, advice. Just, it's really important to, to be involved with your, um, with your respiratory team. So, Respiratory care services activities may include cardiopulmonary um, diagnostics, emergency resuscitation, the administration of medical gases and aerosolized medications, bronchial hygiene therapies, airway management procedures, lung expansion therapies, mechanical ventilation, uh, and blood gas sampling and analysis. Each of these procedures is a potential source of infection for the patient or the practitioner. Um, you know, they're they're talking about um, blood gas sampling and analysis, one of the things that I think is really important as infection preventionists for you to be involved with is um, really talking to your RTs about um, your A-line management. Because one of, the th one of the patterns that I have personally found within my organization is that we work on all of these SOPs, right? We work on all of these policies and procedures, documents that focus on here's the workflow, here's who owns this, here's who owns that. But there are times when infection prevention doesn't really have an input into these different areas. And an A-line is a 
is a vascular access device. So how are they being inserted? Have you recently seen any insertions? What is their technique like? Um, what are, you know, what type of dressings are they using? What's the frequency of them, you know, of them changing their transducers? Like there is so much that, that you need to be involved with. Um, and let me tell you something, you're not gonna learn it all, all at once. Um, it's gonna take some time, but you have to at least take the time. We've got some risk factors for respiratory infections. So those are gonna be age, so if premature, you're young or elderly, severe underlying disease, respiratory and other chronic illnesses, immune suppression, enteral feedings, thoracic or abdominal surgery, um, and invasive ven ventilatory support. All of these are, are risk factors for um, respiratory infections. So. As you guys know, I went back to school. I'm back in school. I'm I'm trying to decide what <laughs> what I want to do with my life. Um, I mean, it's obviously infection prevention, but I, I feel like I've got some skill sets I need to further develop. Um, but right now, I'm taking this course called Modern Human Diseases um, at my alma mater, the University of South Florida, and I'm really enjoying it. And um, one of the recent assignments that I worked on was really trying to understand oropharyngeal flora better. And so the first bullet point is from the APIC text, which is that most bacterial healthcare associated pneumonias occur when organisms colonizing the oropharynx, oropharynx or upper gastrointestinal tract are aspirated. And then the bottom bullet point is actually from a recent assignment that I submitted a couple weeks ago, um, which is really talking about once a bacterial species colonizes the oropharyngeal cavity in very high numbers, you can find almost the identical microorganis microorganisms in the lower respiratory tract. Um, and so it, it's, why is this important, right? Because it, it all ties together, okay? It all ties together. It's all there, all of the pieces of the puzzle come together. So when you're looking at your Shea guidelines, when you're looking at um, your APIC text, when they're talking to you about the importance of oral care, when they're talking to you about all of these different things, it's because it's all, it's all connected. We have to pay attention to all of the different types of interventions that we can that we can be implementing to to you know to reduce the the chances of ventilator associated events. The other part was in 2015 there was a study that was conducted in Switzerland that talked about some of the common commensal oropharyngeal flora, and it's typically going to be that viridans streptococci, coagulase negative staph, Haemophilus species, Moraxella, Corynebacterium, um, Neisseria prevotella. Additionally, candida species are also considered to be non-pathogenic and only occasionally, occasionally can cause pneumonia. Um, patients in the intensive care unit may require mechanical ventilation and can then develop an abnormal carrier state with an overgrowth of um, MRSA, gram-negative bacilli such as Klebsiella, Enterobacter, Citrobacter, Proteus, Morganella, Serratia, Acinetobacter, and Pseudomonas. And when I was learning about oropharyngeal flora, it really started putting some of these NHSN definitions that we work with on a daily basis into perspective. It was really starting to help me. Um, it was really starting to help me understand, um, you know, oh, okay, I, I understand why these organisms are excluded. Another another paper that I that I did read um, for my course was the uh, was discussing the gut lung axis. So in a recent study published in 2021, they examined the relationship between the gut and the lungs and refer to it as the gut lung axis, which is described as a bi-directional relationship between pulmonary diseases and the influence that it has in the gut microbiota. And in this study, they also tied it into COVID-19, which is which suggests that um, you know COVID infection alters the gut barrier, leading to the systemic spread of bacteria, endotoxins, and um, microbial m uh, metabolites. So, with that being said, this is what our NHSN definition says: are some of the excluded organisms that cannot be used to meet the um, pneumonia or VAP definitions. So you've got that all of that normal respiratory flora, normal oral flora, etc. But the following organisms, unless they're identified from lung tissue or pleural fluid, um, where the specimen was obtained during thoracentesis or within 24 hours of a chest tube placement. Um, are not eligible, which is candida species, so yeast, any coagulase negative staph species, or any enterococcus species. So, you know, all of this, you know, learning more about oropharyngeal flora really started putting together some of these NHSN definitions for me. Um, 
what are some key concepts when it comes to respiratory care services? So intubation is going to bypass our first line of protective mechanisms in the upper airway, and it's going to increase the risk of aspiration and subsequent infections of the lung. Mechanical ventilation systems are another potential source of infection. Uh, when appropriate, practitioners should consider using non-invasive ventilation to, the, to reduce the risk of infection. And this is, um, you know, our, the APIC text, so this chapter specifically, Respiratory Care Services, um, was written in 2014. But this bullet point I highlighted specifically because it aligns with the guidelines that SHEA, um, IDSA, and APIC published last month. That's also a recommendation that they give. Uh, routes of transmission of pathogens most commonly are associated with respiratory care are going to be those airborne droplet nuclei, direct contact with contaminated fluids, hands, and equipment. All right, some routes of transmission uh, may be from the practitioner or the device to the patient, from one patient to another, from patient to caregiver or from one body site to the lower respiratory tract of the same patient via a hands or a device. Um, and so that's why it's really important to talk to your um, RTs about the importance of, um, you know, handling all of their equipment correctly, their medications. Um, I, I have actually spent time with multiple respiratory therapists at, you know, at my hospital learning about their processes and just kind of asking them questions. <laughs> um, so I remember one of the first times I shadowed a respiratory therapist. She's very sweet. Um, her name is Caitlin. She was like, oh, okay. She's like, you're shadowing me today? She's like, um, well, did I do something wrong? <laughs> she was immediately thinking, oh, infection prevention is going to spend hours with me today? What does this mean? Does this mean I did something wrong? Um, but you know, I told her, no, I'm actually here to learn. I want, I want to learn from you. There's so much that you know, so much knowledge that you have, and I think that that's one of the biggest pieces of advice that I have um, for my fellow infection preventionists, is to not be afraid to reach out and to get to know about the workflow, um, the challenges that they have. Uh, there's really nothing like spending some time with with your frontline staff and really getting to hear about their, you know, their issues, their concerns, um, and how you can help them. Uh, you know, we were able to advocate for our respiratory department to get an additional like a conference room turned into, you know, a storage room for them because of the amount of supplies, you know, all of this stuff. Like, it's just, it's great to to work on those relationships. Um, contaminated aerosols are associated with pneumonias due to Legionella, Aspergillus, and Serratia marcescens. Improperly cleaned and disinfected respiratory care equipment, inappropriate, in inappropriate environmental disinfection or lapses in hand hygiene can all lead to the spread of infection in any patient. Um, one of the things that our team does is we really try to attend um, their quarterly meetings and we try to we try to present. Sometimes it's only five minutes, sometimes it can be 10 minutes depending on the agenda, but we try to talk to them about um, VAEs, I've talked to them about nails, <laughs> uh, talked to them about the importance of you know good hand hygiene. So you know, just start, start slow, work, work with, you know, you have to get out there. You have to spend some time um, with, with your, with your teams. And it's not just, it's not just respiratory care. It's all of your different teams. I remember one of the most meaningful um, moments I've, I've really had as an IP is getting to, to work night shift with one of our labor and delivery nurses and really having the opportunity to talk to her about you know, some of their barriers, uh, things that, that we could help them with, and uh, just having that opportunity to connect. So what is one of the things that you can do to assess your, um, your program for being able to prevent ventilator-associated events? So I always recommend that people get familiar with the ICAR, which is the Infection Control um, Assessment and Response Tool. This one's for acute care hospitals. And so this is Section E, which is Prevention of Ventilator-Associated Events. So you can do this with your RT department. Hey, do we have a nurse champion or a physician champion uh, or a champion, <laughs> RT champion for VAE prevention strategies? Oh, um, well, I don't, you know, do we, do we not? Uh, 
do we have training that we're providing to all personnel for respiratory therapy for ventilated pa patients, uh, suctioning and administration of aerosolized medications? When is that training provided? Is it provided upon hire? Do they have to do it annually? Uh, what happens if there's new equipment that's introduced? How do you guys do the training? All of this stuff is important for you to know. Some additional questions. Does the hospital routinely audit? You know, do your ed, do your do your RT educators audit? Does infection prevention do audits um, of whether we're adhering to this or not? Can you describe what the process for that is? Do we provide feedback to personnel regarding their performance for the management of ventilated patients? Are we are we telling them like, hey, we're missing opportunities on spontaneous breathing trials? Are we, are we missing opportunities for X, Y, and Z? All of these are very important questions to have with your teams. Some additional things you can ask is. Um, can you describe the method to trigger the daily assessments? So is there a checklist? Are there daily round, rounds? Are there reminders? This is a really great form for you to become familiar with. The other thing that I want to um, bring up is respiratory therapists are an amazing part of your healthcare team. Okay, they are extremely knowledgeable. Um, we recently had an infection preventionist um, who was, she's just absolutely excellent. She moved over to one of our larger campuses um, but she was our one of our IPs for a year and she came over from respiratory therapy and just truly, truly, truly wonderful infection preventionist. So please, for those of you who are part of infection prevention teams and who are hiring managers, please consider um, giving some respiratory therapists an opportunity to become infection preventionists, I think you will be really, really surprised. They have a very different way of looking at our role. They have a very different way of looking at um, the type of interventions that they can make. So lots of references. All right, back to questions. Okay, so we're moving on to surgical services. So which of the following scenarios would be most appropriate for immediate use sterilization? A, the vendor brings the instrument for the procedure the morning of the surgery, which does not allow for the full sterilization process. B, the instrument used for the procedure is dropped on the floor of the operating room and another instrument is not available. C, the turnaround time between procedures does not allow enough time for the full sterilization process. Or D, the OR does not have the needed instruments to meet the demand of surgeries, so the instruments are flashed between procedures. Excellent. Good job. So all of you um, answered this question correctly. So the instrument used for the procedure is dropped on the floor of the operating room and another instrument is not available. <laughs> so that's gonna be the most appropriate time to use um, immediate use sterilization. We really like to highly discourage the use of IUSS. It used to be called flash sterilization. Uh, but immediate use steam sterilization, we really try to discourage that unless it really truly is like we have no other options, right? We don't have that. That's a very expensive piece of equipment. We only have one. We dropped it on the floor. Like we have no choice at this point. Um, the vendor brings the instruments for the procedure the morning of the surgery, which does not allow for the full sterilization process. This is completely, completely unacceptable behavior. Um, just completely unacceptable behavior. Um, if you have vendors, they should be bringing in their equipment, making sure that there's ample time for it, you know, for the process to be done. And that's why it's important for you to have good relationships with your SPD department, because they'll be able to tell you if there's specific, you know, vendors that they may be having issues or problems with. The turnaround time between procedures does not allow enough time for the full sterilization process. That's unacceptable. Uh, you should not be, you know, that, it, no. And then the OR does not have the needed instruments to meet the demand of surgeries or so the instruments are flashed between procedures. That's also completely unacceptable. 
Okay, flash sterilization, again, that's the old term. We refer to it as IUSS, immediate use steam sterilization, um, is a quick steam sterilization cycle that does not use the full sterilization cycle of exposure and dry times. Exposure may be abbreviated in gravity steam sterilizers by eliminating wrapping material or using container systems that ensure that the steam has unrestricted access to the instruments. AORN, um, and Amy recommend that flash sterilization should only be used when there is an urgent need for the items. Okay, question number two. An IP conducts an audit of the OR cleaning process. The action that would be most concerning would be, A, the OR is terminally cleaned at the end of each business day. B, the decontamination process starts on the floor of the OR and works upwards towards the lighting. C, the cleaning solutions are prepared daily. D, a wet vacuum and microfiber mop head are used to clean the OR floors. Excellent, yes. B, the decontamination process starts on the floor of the OR and works upwards towards the lighting. Yeah. That would be extremely concerning. So we always, we, we have to remember we wanna work from high to low, right? If you start by cleaning the floor, right? Because why, I'm not sure, but if that's where you start and you do a, you know, you, you, do your, you do your clean, you move from the floor and you're moving up and then you do dusting at the end, what, what's gonna happen? You're gonna disrupt all of that and then it's gonna contaminate come down on all of the surfaces that you've already cleaned. And remember, you have to start high to low. You have to start high to low, cleanest to dirtiest, okay? The OR being terminally cleaned at each business, at the end of each business day, yes, we should do that. Um, cleaning solutions are prepared daily, yes. Um, the wet vacuum and microfiber mop are used to clean the OR floors, okay, acceptable. All right, let's do some general reviews. So we're gonna go ahead and go through some, to go through these questions. Um, question one, which of the following specimens can remain at room temperature after collection if transport to the lab will be delayed? Which of the following specimens can remain at room temperature after collection if transport to the lab will be delayed? A, sputum, B, urine, C, stool, D, cerebral spinal fluid. I'm gonna give you another five seconds. So you've already gotten a lot of answers. Mm. Okay, for those of you who put cerebral spinal fluid, you are correct. Cerebral spinal fluid should be transported to the laboratory immediately after collection if possible. If this is not possible, then it should be maintained at room temperature and transported within one hour. We've done this before, we're gonna do it again because guess what, you have to know your lab and your transportation rules for this test. It is a non-negotiable. You have to know this stuff. Um, for those of you who have been dealing with the monkeypox situation, you guys know how much they have, um, um, how much the Department of Health has really harped on proper specimen handling, storage, and shipping. Let me tell you something. This is not only applicable to the, the CIC. You just got to know this just to function in life. Um, and yeah, my little stool, <laughs> my little stool, it makes me laugh every time. Okay, so we're going to start with the first one. The first one is urine. Are we going to refrigerate it or is it going to be room temp? Refrigeration or room temperature? And you know what, this is gonna be rapid fire because there's no excuse. We've been through this at least twice already um, in the past couple of weeks. Okay, the next one is cerebral spinal fluid. We just did this one, no excuse, room temperature. My cute little stool sample there. Are we gonna refrigerate it or room temperature? Okay, good job to those who said refrigerate. Then, then we have our sputum. Sputum, refrigeration or room temp? Very good. Um, vaginal secretions or, you know, 
I mean, this is the picture of vaginal secretions. So vaginal secretions. Room temperature or refrigeration? Room temperature. Eyes. Eye fluid. Eye specimens. Refrigeration or room temperature? Room temperature. Food for thought. Food for thought. One of the things for you to consider is um, for those of you who, um, you know, who have um, agencies that come to collect um, eye tissue and eye specimens um, after a patient has deceased, right, has passed, has expired, um, good question to ask is where is that happening? Where is that happening in your facility? Are they going down to the morgue and collecting there? Um, that's that's a very good that's a very good question to ask um, your teams and have an answer to. I did I I was notified by a colleague that they were um, in one instance they were actually doing it in a, in a hallway. Um, they were they were just putting up these little you know the little hall dividers and and doing yeah in the hallway. So make ask some questions find out where it's happening in your facility. All right, question number two. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Infection Control Guidelines, routine microbiological sampling is indicated for which of the following? A is respiratory therapy equipment, B is sterile disposable equipment, C is dialysis fluid, and D is operating room surfaces. Routine microbiological sampling is indicated for which of the following? You guys are doing great today. Dialysis fluid is correct. Um, remember that we don't want to be the sampling fairies. We don't just want to be sampling everything. Microbiological sampling of air, water, and inanimate sampling is an expensive and time-consuming process and is not routinely recommended. Routine microbiological sampling is indicated, however, for quality assurance purposes, such as monthly culturing of water used in hemodialysis applications and for the final dialysate use dilution. Question three, DMAIC refers to a data-driven quality strategy for improving processes and is an integral part of the Six Sigma quality initiative. The DMAIC format includes all of these except A is M, measure the performance of the process involved. B, define the customer um, project boundaries and improvement processes. C, improve the target process by designing creative solutions to fix and prevent problems. Or D, which is um, control the improvements only until problems are no longer prevalent. Okay, let's see. Oh, everybody's putting D, excellent. Yep, control the improvements only until problems are no longer prevalent. Here's our rationale, DMAIC, an abbreviation for define, measure, analyze, improve, and control, refers to a data-driven improvement cycle used for improving, optimizing, and stabilizing business processes and designs. The DMAIC improvement cycle is the core tool used to drive Six Sigma projects. The purpose of control step is to sustain the gains of, pro of the process and to monitor the improvements to ensure continued and sustainable success. All right, question four. The NICU medical director has requested the NICU HAI rate for bloodstream infections. He wants baseline data and asks you to design and implement a hand washing campaign using the BSI rate as one of the outcome indicators. He wants this data presented to the performance improvement program. In the NICU, what information do you need to best risk stratify data? A is gender, B is birth weight, C is length of stay, and D is age. Okay. Lots of bees. Bees are winning. There was um, one C, but it's going to be birth weight, okay? 
for um, stratification. Okay, this is going to be a form of risk adjustment that involves classifying data into subgroups based on one or more characteristics. It is common for patients in the neonatal ICU to be stratified by birth weight. Okay, by birth weight. And there's typically a survey that you have to complete every year if you have a NICU that asks you how many babies you have born in, um, under each weight category. So um, for those of you who do have NICUs, this, this, this type of question would be a, much easier than for those of our IPs who maybe work in ambulatory care, who maybe don't um, don't have a NICU in their facility. But remember, birth weight, birth weight. Okay, question five. Which of the following is true about sampling of water and dialysis and dialysate in dialysis? A, sampling should be carried out annually. B, results from sampling might not accurately reflect the levels of microbes in the water or dialysate. C, blood agar may be used as a growth medium. Or D, a calibrated loop may be used to inoculate spread plates. Okay, we don't have a lot of answers for this one. That's okay. That's okay. So one of the one of the first things that we need to understand is, um, you know, the sampling of water. It is not annually. Okay, so it should be done on a monthly basis. So that one right there, um, we can we can cross off as one of our answer choices. The correct answer is that results from sampling might not accurately reflect the levels of microbes in the water or dialysate. Um, so this is this is where it tells you i'm going to start with the second part testing may be carried out by the membrane filter technique or by spread plates test results can be used to drive decisions about disinfection schedules but because bacteria may exist in biofilms and therefore um, be difficult to isolate in dialysis systems the test results may not um, be an accurate measure of the true level of microbes in the system Okay, a gram-negative bacterium responsible for chronic antral gastritis and a major factor in peptic ulcer disease is A, H. pylori, B, C. diff, C, H. pyogenes, or D, salmonella typhi. Okay, everyone literally knows this one. We're not even going to spend any time on it. All right, I'm not even going to read the definition because everybody put A. <laughs> <laughs> All right, question seven. Microorganisms are grown on culture media made of an agar base. Additive to media vary according, um, vary according to growth requirements of organisms and or the desire to select out a specific organism. Fastidious organisms, which are, those are, are organisms that are difficult to grow, right? So fastidious organisms require blank type of media and Blank type of media is used to inhibit normal common commensals. Number one is differential. Number two is enriched. Number three is selective. Number four is nutrient broth. And number five is synthetic sheep blood agar. Okay, very good. Lots of Bs. So yeah, it's going to be two and three. So we're going to use our enriched media for fastidious organisms and selective media um, for, what was the thing? And selective media to inhibit um, common commensal growth. So there we have it. Uh, this is the growth media. We've been over this before. You've got your just your nutrient agar, which is going to support the growth of lots of different bacteria. Your enrichment medium, which contains special nutrients for the growth of fastidious bacteria. Your selective media, which contains chemicals or antibiotics designed to inhibit normal common commensal. And then your differential, which is going to stain your colonies of specific organisms while inhibiting the growth of others. All right. Really quickly, this is a really great case study. So we've got a 36-year-old man that presented to the emergency department with a two-week history of a fever, headache, drowsiness, and photophobia. He was previously healthy and was sexually active with men. Physical examination was notable for a temperature of 38.3 degrees Celsius and neck stiffness. Um, the CT of the head was normal. The opening pressure on the lumbar puncture was 29 centimeters of water. The CSF cell count was 340 cells per microliter 
with 90% mononuclear cells, which were predominantly lymphocytes. The glucose level was 46 uh, milligrams per deciliter uh, to, oh, and it, show, it tells you the reference range. And the protein level was 0 0.8 grams per liter. Uh, the gram stain, which is panel A, um, and the India ink stain, which is panel B, and they're right here, A and B, reveal abundant encapsulated round yeast with some budding forms. What pathogen do you suspect? And this is off the New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, so very good for those of you who put um, crypto, cryptococcus neoformans. Cryptococcus neoformans, which is um, abbreviated C neoformans, is a fungus that lives in the environment throughout the world. People can become infected with C neoformans after breathing in the microscopic fungus, although most people who are exposed to the fungus never get sick from it. Okay, but again, you got to pay attention to how do you get this? How is it acquired? So some CDC fast facts. Infections with the fungus cryptococcus um, neoformans or C. gadii is called cryptococcus. It affects the lungs or the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, brain infections due to the fungus are called cryptococcal meningitis. C. neoformans infections are extremely rare in people who are otherwise healthy. Most cases of C. neoformans infections occur in people who have weakened immune systems, particularly those who have advanced HIV or AIDS, and C. neoformans infections are not contagious. So with that being said, which of the following precautions should be used for a patient who is immunocompromised and suspected of having cryptococcal meningitis? A. Contact precautions for staff and the family being restricted from visiting other patients. B, standard precautions for family and staff. C, a mask worn when within three feet from the bed. Or D, airborne precautions for 24 hours after an antibiotic is started if the patient is improving. Very good. Yep, it's going to be our standard precautions for family and staff. Remember, I always tell you guys, they want to know if you know about these diseases, how they're transmitted, and how you prevent them. Like, what is it? Is it a bacteria? Is it a fungus? Is it a virus? How can I get it? How can I come into contact with it? We already went over, you know, soil. You got to inhale. You got to breathe these things in. How can I pass it on? It, we just read our fast facts that it's not contagious, so standard precautions are okay. So, crypto, cryptococcus or cryptococcal disease is a potentially fatal fungal disease caused by one of two species. Cryptococcal meningitis is believed to result from the dissemination of the fungus from either an observed or unappreciated pulmonary infection. Fungal meningitis is not transmitted from person to person and requires the use of standard precautions. Standard precautions. All right, question nine. Regarding ice machines in healthcare facilities, which of the following is the most highly recommended practice? A, do not store pharmaceuticals or medical solutions on ice intended for consumption. B, do not handle ice directly by hand and wash your hands before obtaining the ice. C, clean, disinfect, and maintain ice storage chests on a regular basis. And then D, machines that dispense ice are preferred to those that require ice to be removed from bins or chests with a scoop. So they have this question set up in a way that they set up a ton of their questions. And it's the second part, which is which of the following is the most highly recommended practice? So which of the following is the most highly recommended practice? So you have to pick the absolute best answer provided, which that typically means, hey, you probably have multiple right answers, but which one <laughs> is the most important one? Okay. And the most important one is do not store any pharmaceuticals or medical solutions on ice intended for consumption. Okay. It doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have to worry about these other two. Oh, do not handle ice directly by hand and wash hands before obtaining ice. Um, okay, well, 
we're, we're talking about ICE machines and healthcare facilities, right? So all of these may be applicable, but which one do you really want to make sure you don't do is you don't want to store any pharmaceuticals in ICE that's meant for consumption. ICE that is intended for consumption is not sterile and most likely contains microbes that can potentially cause infection, especially if they contaminate pharmaceuticals or medical solutions. Even small number of microbes can cause serious infection if directly inhaled or injected into the bloodstream. Therefore, sterile ice or specially manufactured chilling equipment should be used instead to store pharmaceuticals or medical solutions in intended for consumption. You have to keep this in mind when you're taking the, the test. When they have those questions set up like that, that which of the following is the most highly recommended, which one would you do first, which one is the best, pay attention because it usually means, hey, there's multiple right answers. Question 10, an example of a selective media that inhibits gram-positive bacteria is A, saburar agar, B, chocolate agar, C, uh, tryptocase soy agar, or D, McConkie's agar. An example of a selective media that inhibits gram-positive bacteria. Very good, McConkie Sagar. Yes, selective media include a chemical com uh, component that inhibits the growth of some microbes. An example of a medium that is selective for gram-negative bacteria is McConkie's agar, which contains crystal violet and bile salts to inhibit the growth of gram-positive bacteria. All right, that's it for today. So week 11, we've got assigned readings. So next week is the 4th of July weekend. So we definitely will not be meeting for the 4th of July, which means that our next group meeting is gonna be on July 8th, because everybody goes out of town. Everybody's gonna be out of town that week. I mean, I will not be out of town, but <laughs> I'll be working. But, um, you know, everyone's gonna be, most mostly everyone's gonna be out of town. So I will see you guys on July 8th. Uh, you know, good luck to those of you who may be taking your test soon. Uh, it's great to be able to get back together and, and get the group started back up. I know we went on a little bit of a break there. It's been a busy past couple of weeks, but hopefully this was helpful. Um, keep practicing, keep doing your chapter readings, and I will see you guys in two weeks.